Okay, so let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very happy um, to be here today and uh, with the uh, retinal rounds, and we'll talk about um, age-related macular degeneration. I'm not sure if this was clear on the invite that we are talking about optimizing outcomes in this very common disease. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, give an introduction um, on the topic, and then we will have our three retinal fellows to address uh, specific neotherapeutic options, which are partially already available, or and some of them are hopefully um, upcoming um, soon to our patients. As a disclosure, um, I will um, discuss um, some of uh, these new therapeutic options um, uh, from pharmaceutical companies, and maybe also there are also some imaging device manufacturers involved, um, which I'm linked to in terms of res research funding, consultancy, um, contracted research, and uh, honoria, mainly as part of my reading center activities. So as an introduction, um, AMD, um, as we all know, is a common um, cause of irreversible visual loss, and almost 10% of the worldwide populations are um, affected. Uh, alone in the US, we have 11 million people um, with this devastating um, disease. And if you look into the future, the numbers are even expect to, um, to double by 2050. So why are we here today? Um, this is to share with you um, the the current um, state that we are actually entering a new era in AMD management. So if you think about, that's all uh, all about anti-VEGF and every four, every six, every eight weeks injection, though this is um, almost now history. And there are several um, developments um, to report. The first one is that um, the patents for um, ranibizumab and bevacizumab have expired in the US last year. Um, and they're set to expire um, this year, in the middle of this year in Europe, while um, uh, Flibosep, we still have some time um, to go. We also have very exciting news of new, two new approvals. Um, this is a port delivery system um, approved la end of last year and um, Farizumab um, approved last month. And this will be addressed in um, detail by our two senior uh, retina fellows uh, and the following. And also there are more breaking news. Um, if we uh, go beyond um, neovascular AMD, probably the most um, prominent news is that uh, Picacetoplan, that's the Apalis um, um, drug, has um, reported a promising early phase three results um, last year. And um, this, uh, there are many, many, as I said, there are many, many um, other current um, therapeutic um, strategy um, uh, tested in clinical trials. Um, some of them already in phase three and um, some of them are expected to report actually in 2022, so uh, until the end of this year. It's uh, kind of um, challenging to keep track on this topic right now because there's so many developments. And as you may um, imagine, um, it's not all in peer reviewed journals. Most of this information you can get is on the internet. Um, on uh, on press releases or on stock mark um, information. So what opportunities exist in principle to optimize outcome um, of our AMD patients? And I think there are two different approaches. One is for the neovascular form that we increase the treatment durability, reduce the treatment burden and um, improve the real world outcomes. And the other one, and this is probably, uh, or this is uh, obviously uh, much more challenging, is to address the multifactual nature of the disease other than um, the um, um, antibody treatment. So this is a list, um, and I'm not saying that this is complete, but this is a list of treatment strategies to relieve the burden of the frequent four weeks, six weeks, eight week monitoring um, and treatment of neovascular AMD. And th the first three on the list will be addressed by our retinal fellows. Um, these include a new molecular targets, um, the continuous drug delivery device combination with a reservoir and the gene therapy. Um, but there are others just to be complete, um, including a degradable implant, a slow clearing large molecule and um, uh, an, an old um, 
successful treatment option, the aflibercept, to use it at a high dose. And um, just to give you some ideas about the benchmark, this degradable implants or the slow clearing large molecules are currently tested um, to be given every six months, so twice um, uh, a year, and not in this four week or eight week schedule. Um, I, before um, I will um, leave the floor for the retinal fellows, um, I will I would like to briefly touch on um, on biosimilars, which are low cost alternatives for anti vegetal therapy, and they are just entering the market or the uh, access to our patients um, right now. So what are biosimilars? Biosimilars are almost identical copies of an original biological medical product that can be introduced after the patents expire. They have a similar molecular structure as the originator, um, but it's not a generic drug because it's not a chemical, um, it's not synthetic manufactured, it's a biologic with a high molecular complexity and it's produced in living systems. And as of such, the manufacturing process is reported to be quite complex and varies on different factors. Um, there's indeed an extensive review and approval process in place um, as defined by um, our agencies, including the um, FDA. Um, and if we look um, beyond ophthalmology, biosimilars have largely changed the world um, in uh, oncology and other disciplines. Um, and in terms of economics, I'm sorry, I have to talk again about economics, but um, this is uh, uh, always in the discussion with these new developments. And um, uh, we see um, it, it's projected to save over $100 million in healthcare in the next five years, the biosimilars. So these are biosimilars in ophthalmology for neovascular AMD. And there's a, this is more than one, as you can, can see, and two of them are already um, approved. Um, and um, I can I can skip this maybe, but um, if you look um, beyond the US in India, um, there, there's already an approved biosimilar that has been used and there have been some reports about ocular inflammation. Um, in terms of the terminology, you may have seen this already on TV that there are several spots outside of themology again, where they have these um, antibody names uh, followed by um, um, a four letter random appearing suffix. And this is the way how biosimilars are, um, are, are, are labeled. Um, so you have the originator and then you have a random four letter um, suffix to keep track um, about the actual agent. And there are no currently approved uh, um, aflibercept biosimilar or bevacizumab uh, similars in, in the US. And you may have heard that there was a shortage about uh, on bevacizumab last year. And some people or health insurance companies suggested to use bevacizumab biosimilars license for oncology to apply in the eye. And there, were, um, there was a, a red flag that this uh, should not be um, done. Okay, so um, talking about um, to address the multifactorial disease of AMD, of, obviously this is a much more complex question and we will not answer this um, today, um, but to summarize, um, there are different pathways into, the, into discussion and there are huge different ways of application, uh, how to apply new therapeutical um, agents. Um, and um, just to address um, some of them today, um, one attempt, one target is neuroprotection. Um, um, this is, um, I'm, this is, there have been several attempts in the past, but no major breakthrough. Um, in this context, I think it's always important to note that the ARID supplementation didn't show an effect on progression of the trophic lesion size. Uh, it showed, as, as, as you know, that you can reduce um, the risk for conversion to late stage disease, but once you have atrophy, um, it doesn't, uh, doesn't do much to the further expansion of lesions. Um, a big topic which is currently under discussion is uh, what is summarized here as rejuvenate, repair and generate damaged cells. Um, this includes photobiomodulation and subthreshold nano laser second intervention, still in phase two on the edge of uh, phase three. Um, there are, and this is a, a list of current stem cell approaches ongoing. Um, so this list is getting longer and longer in my impression.
now to very advanced AMD, um, probably also looking for Um, published um, last year as early phase three. There was a trend um, of a positive effect on lesion size expansion. One game is the audio coming up for you as well. Sorry? It just seems like the audio may have been cutting out. Hungam, was it cutting out for you as well? Um, Stefan, would you mind just turning your camera off? That might help. It was just in the past probably 20 seconds that it was cutting out. Yes, it was cut off on me as well. Sorry. No, no worries at all. Um, Conclude, um, there's an increasing number of activities and uh, so targets beyond Medjev, which we will not discuss into detail today. As, as an outlook, um, I think there will be more and more treatments options coming up and we will have this. Simonette, who will talk about the um, PDS um, implant. Please, Jeff. Great. Uh, thanks, thanks, Stefan. Let me uh, try to share my screen. All right. Um, do, uh, do, do you guys just see the slide or do you see the full? Uh, we, we see the presenter view. So, okay. Um, Let me try to switch it. Yep. How about now? Still presenter view. In the top left, you might be able to click the use slideshow. Sometimes that. Um, Let's see one more try here. There we got it. You got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, well, great. So obviously a, a lot in the pipeline and a few things newly available. Uh, so I'm going to talk about one of those things that uh, can potentially help us achieve continuous delivery of intraocular VEGF. This is my wife enjoying some Utah powder up on Little Water Peak. Let me just move this here. Okay, so uh, this is the brand new port delivery system, which has been uh, named SUSVIMO. It looks like a little Eppendorf tube, and this is a surgically placed refillable implant that sits in the vitreous cavity uh, that can slowly and continuously diffuse anti-VEGF, uh, specifically ranibizumab. Uh, into the vitreous cavity for exudative AMD patients. And this is what it looks like in the eye. This is, um, I believe this is at about a post uh, one month visit uh, that's been uh, published in one of their more recent papers that shows it externally where we can refill it. And then also as it sits in the vitreous cavity, uh, we'll get to some short surgical videos a little bit later as well. And then the refill happens uh, just in clinic with the uh, kind of a bi-directional exchange uh, needle that removes the uh, old fluid and replaces it with new high concentration of ranibizumab. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the data and the trials that led to the now recent FDA approval of the PDS. So the, the phase two or ladder trial uh, happened a few years ago. This looked at different concentrations of ranibizumab in the PDS as well as comparison to monthly intravitreal injections. Their primary outcome for this phase two study was not vision, but uh, time to first refill, which uh, had to meet uh, both specific vision and OCT-based criteria. And at the highest dose of ranibizumab, uh, this was 15.8 months uh, from implant to time to uh, mean first refill. 
Uh, this also helped determine the appropriate dose and as we'll see in a bit, improve some surgical steps uh, within the protocol. Um, and then more recently, we have the phase three archway trial. So this was a randomized open label trial conducted at 78 different sites across the US. Um, here, the primary outcome was change in best corrected visual acuity. Uh, unlike the latter trial uh, in Archway, they had a planned and mandatory refill uh, for all patients with PDS at six months. And kind of their, their ultimate outcome was that the PDS implant was found uh, both non-inferior and equivalent to monthly ranibizumab. So uh, let's dive a little more into this phase three trial uh, that came out not too long ago in ophthalmology. Uh, so some, some uh, specific inclusion exclusion criteria, not comprehensive, but I think some of the key ones. Uh, so patients had to be diagnosed with wet AMD within uh, nine months prior to enrollment. And really importantly, they had to demonstrate structural response on OCT and show either stable or improved vision uh, after three or more anti-VEGF injections prior to enrollments in the trial. So you had to prove that they were anti-VEGF responsive. Um, also importantly, this wasn't necessarily ranibizumab, it could have been any um, of the available anti-VEGF agents. Um, exclusion criteria, uh, they can't have really severe subfoveal pathology, so no, no fibrosis or atrophy. Uh, their prior treatment could only consist of anti-VEGF therapy, so no PDT, steroids, focal laser, other things like that. Um, and then importantly, as, as we'll see today, also could not have had any um, like glaucoma surgeries or other supertemporal quadrant surgeries in the study eye. Um, so looking at the results, so they enrolled 418 patients, randomized three to two to PDS um, to uh, intravitreal injections. They had a, um, a very high retention rate uh, with completion through the first 40 weeks. And uh, we're looking here at their uh, best corrected visual acuity during those first 40 weeks. And you can see that it stays uh, pretty much equivalent except for a small drop in the PDS group uh, immediately after surgery, which then recovers uh, to their baseline. And this of course looks a little different than the curves we're used to looking at because we don't have the initial improvement uh, included in the trial. And that's because all of these patients had previously received at least three intravitreal anti-VEGF injections. So within the trial, we're not seeing that improvement, but retrospectively they looked and saw that there was an average uh, 11 letter improvement prior to trial enrollment with their initial anti-VEGF therapy. Um, so th this curve now looks pretty similar to what we've seen in the original Anchor and Marina trials. Um, similarly, they also showed uh, stable and equivalent um, OCT thickness measurements um, between the two groups. Um, they also showed that uh, based on their refill criteria, uh, that only 1.6% of the PDS patients required any supplemental injections um, during these first uh, 40 weeks. And, and finally, at the end of the 40 weeks, they sent out a questionnaire and, and the vast majority of patients who had the PDS implant uh, were happy with it and, and said that they preferred that over monthly injections. Uh, so let's look a little bit at some of um, these surgical videos. This doesn't show all the steps. And I'll talk a little bit about how they changed the surgical procedure a bit from kind of the beginning of the ladder study to the end of the archway study. Um, so they, they measure a 3.5 um, scleral, 3.5 millimeter scleral measurement, which is four millimeters back from the limbus. This is after they've done a careful pyridomy in the supertemporal quadrant. You'll also notice that they have a 27 gauge infusion line, which they actually don't turn on until the end of the case, just to repressurize the eye if it is soft. And many, many surgeons also use a traction suture, uh, much like for trabs or tubes. Um, so let's play here as they do a careful cut down with an MVR blade. And then a new step that they added that they found that reduced vitreous hemorrhages was they used the endo laser to treat uh, kind of that exposed uvea to then uh, reduce vitreous hemorrhages that, that were associated with the PDS and then with the actual um, pars plana incision. And then here's the implantation of the PDS that um, should fit pretty snugly in that incision. 
and they can kind of just uh, tap it in there. And then of course, uh, closure is super important, which is a, a little unusual for retina surgeons. And, and I think we have a lot to learn from glaucoma. And, and at the end of this, I'd love, love to get their feedback about things <clears throat> that are, you know, tips or th things that could, could potentially be done better. Uh, but, but kind of a two-layer closure where you're ensuring that TINA and N conjunctiva um, is, is closed here. Also selecting patients that, that have healthy conjunctiva um, also seems to be important, um, but, but really ensuring that there is going to be uh, the lowest risk possible, possible of retraction or erosion or exposure of this implant is really key <clears throat> in its surgical success. And then the refill in clinic is really interesting. So I have a little animation here. So it uses the shorter needle that enters and then uh, extracts the fluid and replaces it with that high concentration of ranibizumab. And this is what it looks like in real life. Um, so, some key points are you have to be almost perfectly perpendicular and uh, you need to target the, the center stock of that PDS implant. So you can see the fluid being extracted there as, as it's being filled at the same time. So pretty quick refill procedure that again in the archway study was performed at six months, um, but the latter study, study did show that um, many patients could go potentially a lot farther with an average out to 50, 15 months uh, for refill. Um, but of course, you know, I think the most important part of all this thinking about, you know, kind of uh, if we're going to be using this and in and, and, and what patients we should be using this is, is the safety profile. Um, so let's, let's kind of get into that a little bit. Uh, so so th this, this is from the phase three archway. So we'll kind of go through the ocular adverse events. So uh, first off was conjunctival bleb or uh, filtering bleb leak. So they saw this in about 6.5% of patients. Uh, here's a couple of pictures of what it looked like. So they, they reported that um, almost all of these 15 out of 16 was just a focalized or a localized conjunctival bleb or swelling without leak that resolved on its own. Uh, that's what you see on the left side of the screen and almost kind of just like an, encaps an encapsulation uh, over the PDS. And then they, they, saw, they saw one kind of more significant uh, bleb, but actually this apparently did not need, need surgical intervention and it resolved um, without treatment. Um, vitreous hemorrhage, like I mentioned, was actually a lot more common um, early in the early part of the phase two ladder study, and it seems to have been improved with addition of that external laser as well as the placement of the infusion line to avoid hypotony at the end of the case. Of note, um, all of these cases, which happened in about 5% of cases, resolved without vitrectomy um, in this archway study. Cataract formation was about the same uh, between the PDS and intravitreal injection patients and, and, and a, a decent number of phacic patients were included in, in both arms. Uh, conjunctival erosion and retra retraction, uh, definitely a, you know, a significant complication here that, that obviously perfecting that surgical technique will hopefully help minimize uh, but nine of 11 of these cases uh, did need some type of surgical intervention, whether it was just repositioning uh, the tenons and conjunctiva, or I think it was somewhere between three and five of these cases required partial thickness corneal grafts um, over that area uh, to help um, where they've had that retraction. Uh, endophthalmitis, uh, clearly a big concern. Um, it happened in 1.6% of patients, so four cases. Uh, which, which was higher than the intravitreal injection uh, arm. Uh, these all occurred more than one month after surgery. So I think kind of like tubes and things like that, that, there's obviously some persistent risk of endophthalmitis with this uh, foreign body in the eye. Uh, importantly, notably three of four of these were associated with conjunctival retraction. So I think that really emphasizes how important um, tenons and conjunctival closure is for this new device in, in both help, helping avoid exposure or erosion, but, but even more importantly, helping that, helping avoid endophthalmitis. 
and then three or four of these cases um, with treatment, some of which included vitrectomy, uh, were able to return to their baseline. Uh, there are also two retinal detachments that were repaired with vitrectomy uh, and one hyphema. So, so clearly some, you know, some elevated risk, which I think is going to come with any surgical procedure and hopefully able to be minimized with uh, surgeon comfort and, and kind of continuing to improve that uh, surgical protocol, but certainly some elevated risks with, with a foreign body there. Um, so kind of thinking about who, who might be, uh, you know, a patient that would benefit from PDS, who would be the per perfect PDS patient. Um, one, I think, you know, this clearly has to be a patient with wet AMD who has shown good responsiveness to anti-VEGF therapy. You don't want to put this into a patient not knowing if they may not be a good responder to anti-VEGF. Uh, they have to have some, some decent visual potential, I think, to, to a kind of accept this um, risk of surgery. Um, they have to have difficulty meeting the current treatment burden. I think we see a big spectrum of patients. Some have no problem coming in every month. They're retired. It's their number one social activity of the month and then they like coming in. I, I think these patients are not the ones who are, who are seeking necessarily these, these longer term treatments. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have a lot of patients that hate coming in for injections. They hate the injections themselves. And they're always asking about more durable treatments or surgical options. So I, I think there, there are definitely um, a, you know, a sizable number of patients who are asking for something like this. And, and you know, I think you, you don't wanna talk a patient into this type of surgical procedure. You want a patient who's able to undergo surgery and enthusiastic about it, who's, who's essentially asking for it. Um, I, I, th I think that will kind of be the ideal patient, especially as we're starting and, and becoming more um, comfortable with, with this type of procedure. Um, ideally, you would want them to have no past or future glaucoma surgeries. Uh, the, the future might be a little hard to predict, but obviously, you know, if a patient has moderate glaucoma or, or maybe any glaucoma, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be using the supertemporal quadrant uh, for this implant. Uh, certainly, you want them to have healthy conjunctiva, which can be a little more difficult in our elderly patients with thin conj, thin tenons, scleral plaques, and things like that. So really, a, a, a close exam of that quadrant, I think, is going to be really important in increasing our success. And then also, you know, uh, we want to think about whether they're a better candidate for something else. We're going to hear about a couple other um, available or upcoming treatment options, um, you know, longer lasting injectables, gene therapy, things like that. Um, so thinking about, you know, is kind of which, which one of these new treatments is best for this patient is something that's going to be, I think, tricky to figure out and, and probably involve a long discussion uh, with the patient and kind of our, our own comfort with the surgical uh, techniques and, and new treatments. So I'd, I'd love to try to answer any questions and especially if the glaucoma folks have any advice or concerns about, about this, uh, I'd love to hear that too. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe. This was an excellent uh, overview and I uh, really appreciate your approach from the practice, your practical approach to the topic. So um, are there any questions? where people are, are getting sorted. Um, you, you addressed at the end um, uh, patient selection. So if you think about the uh, patient populations and uh, having anti-VEGF um, treatment for one year, what would, you, would be your estimate? How many patients, what would be the percentage of patients who would be, you could uh, offer this PDS implant? Is it like 10%, 50%, 80%? Yeah, th th that's a really good question. Yeah. <clears throat> I think... Um, you know, obviously patients that are successfully extended out, you know, the, the longer they're successfully extended on the agents we have right now, there's a little bit of diminishing return in those patients in a surgery like this. I think this surgery probably benefits most the patients who are kind of stuck at four to six weeks and don't like it. Um, that being said, you know, I don't know, I think that's probably, that's still a pretty sizable amount, probably close to, you know, to anywhere from like 20 to 40% of patients, maybe approaching 50% of patients, we just can't get past six weeks or so. And, you know, I would say the majority of those don't like it very much and, and would be very interested in, in a surgical longer lasting option. 
So, you know, my ballpark guess would be something like, I think 25 to 30% of patients would be kind of eligible and, and be the group of patients that would benefit most from this. And then I think it'll be an individual discussion with each one, making sure they understand, you know, the, the risks that come along, especially in the post-op period, um, to see if that's something that they're interested in. Very good. And, and uh, well, what would you um, say is a good responder? So how many anti vegf injections, minimum number of injections should a patient had before moving forward with the implant? Uh, well, I, I certainly, I, I definitely wouldn't go less than three because that was what was done in the trial. Um, I think that's in most patients, I, that's usually enough to, uh, especially if they are, are going to show you a good response, you often know that pretty quickly. Um, you know, the, the other patients, I think this will become uh, an option in our, some of our long-term patients that we've treated for years and years, and we just know that they're still dependent on anti-VEGF, um, but they're ready for something longer acting like this. So I, I think, I think three would, would remain my minimum. Mm -hmm. I see Paul Bernstein and Mike Teske here. Uh, do one of you would like to give an update um, where we are with the Moran on this new treatment option? Okay, I'm, I'm on. Uh, we are, I think, already approved for the PDS, and we're going to be having training on this in the next few weeks in the, towards the end of March. So we're having a special training session, but it should be available. I don't know about, you know, insurance uh, approval will be a challenge. We did hear yesterday that I think nationwide, uh, 45 of these have been implanted commercially. Uh, in the last few, in the last month or so. So it's just starting, but I think, um, you know, it'll, there's gonna be, there is definitely a learning curve and we don't wanna have a bunch of complications right at the beginning. That's, that's not gonna be good for anyone. So your question about, um, you know, kind of conch closure, uh, you know, something we do in small and cataract surgery, I, I'd really, you know, again, really advise you to make sure people do have robust tenons. There's just no replacement for that. Um, and then just make sure that, you know, that you're really down to bare sclera and you're not, you know, leaving any tenons on the base mm -hmm. as well. Those would be the only two uh, tips. I, 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 you know, the archway trial, they did use those partial thickness cornea grafts uh, to cover. Uh, that's been done uh, with, with success, you know, actually over the years for various things like glaucoma. And that's something that uh, I, I think, you know, over time, you know, could be used really effectively. Great, thanks. So exciting times, um, and uh, and to, uh, we move on. And I would like to get, um, introduce Hong Gam, Dr. Lee, who will talk now about the um, bispecific antibody. Can you guys hear me and see my screen appropriately? Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hong Gamle, and I am a second year retina fellow at the Moran Eye Center. And today we'll be talking about a new play on the field, as Dr. Fleckenstein has called it, um, but by small. And this, uh, this has just been recently approved last month, January 2022. Um, this is the business, business wire um, uh, press release. So FDA approved, and it's marketed as the first bispecific antibody uh, designed for intraocular use. Um, and uh, it actually has been approved not only just for a, a new vascular AMD, but also for DME. But today we'll focus on its uh, um, indication and use for uh, wet AMD. So, you caught me stumbling on the pronunciation of the name of this, the, the brand name of these drugs. The generic name is, uh, the scientific name is Farisimab. And the brand name is, uh, I bet a lot of you probably when you see this word pronounced as Babismo. The correct pronunciation as I learned yesterday at um, the, the dinner was is Babismo. And the anatomy of the name actually tell you a lot about what this, uh, molecule is about. So the V in Vibismo stand for the V in anti-VEGF-A, and the A stand for anti-NG2. 
And these are the two pathways that these bispecific molecules aim to target. So the bis here stands for bispecific and the Y is meant to resemble the shape of the molecule. It's like an ITG antibody, so Y shape. And the MO stands for molecule. So just from you know, understanding the anatomy of the name itself, you can have uh, an overall understanding of what this, uh, of the design of this molecule and what it aims to do. So, um, so for a specific antibody, deserving of the use, one molecule, two target, and the two target are um, anti-NG2 and anti-VEGFA. Anti-VEGFA, as we all know, is the target of ILEA, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and just a quick uh, basic sign review, NG2 inhibition of, so the type 2 pathway and the VEGFR2 pathway are the two pathways involved in neovascular um, AMD. And the inhibition of these two by N2 uh, drive vascular instability. And with vascular instability, we have vascular leakage, neovascularization, and inflammation. The first two is what we can visibly see uh, in patients with AMD on OCT and on exam. And uh, the elevated level of both N2 and VEST together synergistically increase the vascular stability, instability, and that leads to uh, what we see as what AMD or new vascular AMD. As we know that both of these uh, levels are elevated or upregulated in a patient with an AMD. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's how our VISMO work, is that it independently binds and neutralize both N2 and VEGFA thereby enable a dual inhibition of two distinct pathways involved in what AMD. This, so this is the first time that we have a medication um, that is designed and has been demonstrated to um, achieve this. And this is a screenshot from the Babismo prescription information that you can get online via this link. So the indication is, as I mentioned, for uh, wet AMD and also diabetic macroedema. And if you follow the instruction of the prescription information um, word by word, then you would do a four, a monthly, a Q4 week um, dosing for the first four months. And then you would evaluate the patient after the first four, four months. You evaluate the patient at uh, eight weeks later and 12 weeks later. So essentially week 20, week 24, to inform you if you are able to extend the patient to 12 weeks and then like, or to 16 weeks or to 12 weeks. So it's a little bit different from how what we do be doing in, uh, in clinical practice with Aaliyah where uh, you do, at Moran, you do like a three monthly, uh, a series of three, so uh, a loading dose, and then you extend by one to two weeks. Uh, here, they extend by up to four weeks. So you have like either eight weeks interval um, or 12 weeks interval treatment or 16 weeks interval treatment, but nothing really in between. And contraindication are just like any other intravitreal injection, no ocular or periopic infection, inflammation, or hypersensitivity to the, the drugs. Um, just a quick note that you know, this has not been studied in um, pregnancy or children. And this clearly most of our patients enroll in the, the trial that led to the FDA approval of uh, elderly patient. So the approval you know, stems from the data that we got from the two phase three uh, clinical studies, uh, Tanea and Luxern. These were, the patient were enrolled in, uh, in 2019 with analysis done 48 weeks um, after analysis. So these are non-inferior trials. They are not meant to be head-to-head -head comparisons. <clears throat> so, um, and the study was conducted over 271 sites across the world, but mostly in the United States and in Europe. 
and maybe a few in uh, Australia and, and uh, in Asia. So who are the patients that were involved in the study? They are patients with um, new vascular AMD, age above 50, treatment naives, um, and they have like macular CNVM. And they were randomly assigned to one-to-one -one ratio to either the study arm or the control arm. The study arm is babaismofarizumab, 6.0 milligram, um, with extension of up to every 16 weeks after four loading, loading dose, versus the control arm is alia, 2.0 milligram every eight weeks after three loading dose. And the analysis um, is conducted at 48 weeks, so roughly one year. And so the primary uh, endpoint outcome measure is mean change in best corrective visual acuity from baseline. At, uh, and they take the average at week um, 40, week 44, week 48 to give you the average here. So in a VABA, this is the 10 year, um, 10 -year uh, trial. Patient with VABA is more again about 5.8 letters versus 5.1 in the aflipocept arms. Same, similarly in the Lucer trial, 6.6 letter versus, so it's the same in both the Bismo and the aflipocept arms. And so just the, the summary here, five to six letters improvement. And this uh, figure here kind of just show you the favorability of um, the Bismo versus Alia and is I would say this close to equivalent. It's not inferior. So what I was trying to tell you, it's not inferior. Whether whether it is superior is not demonstrated here. Um, and this chart graph here tell you at forty eight weeks, how many of these patients are we able to extend to every sixteen weeks? And the answer in both trials are roughly forty five percent. But if you also count those who they were able to extend to 12 weeks, then you get up to 80%. Okay. And then another easy way to look at this is um, at week 48, we have 45, so roughly 50% of patients that are able to extend to 16 weeks. What does that mean? That means they get four, little, four loading dose and plus two injection at week 28 and 44. So they get a total of six injections at 48 weeks. So in one year, they get about six injections. And then 33 of them get seven injection and the rest got nine injection. So on average, you can say that patient uh, who follow the Vabismo clinical trial protocol will end up getting between six to nine injection with most of them, 80% of patients getting either six or seven injection. This is comparing to, at least in this study, all patients in the femicide arm receive a total of eight injection because they get three loading dose and then after that, they get fixed Q8 uh, injection. That means three plus five, so eight injection. So if you take the average, on average, patient in the verbosmal arm get one less injection per year. <clears throat> and we care about uh, common adverse reaction. Um, so very similar safety profile compared to uh, ALIA. The most common is conjunctival hemorrhage, which to us is not detrimental. So that's just a very acceptable um, uh, adverse reaction. The one that we care about are probably, you know, given the recent history of the failure of VLV um, with the concern for retinal vasculitis. Um, these two phase three trial demonstrate no case of retinal vasculitis report, at least in this um, two, phase three clinical trial. In terms of um, R RPE test, something that we were about is 3% for Vibasmo versus 1% for Fibrocep. Um, I don't have here the data for endophthalmitis, but it's less, essentially less than 1%. Okay. But what's the price tag? So a little bit more expensive than ILEA, $2,191 for one dose of Vibasmo versus $1,850 for ALEA. So that's a difference of $340 per dose. However, it is potentially a cheaper treatment option if you are able just to get one less injection per year. And I mentioned earlier that at least from this clinical trial, 
on average, these patients, most patients get uh, one less injection. So the price tax difference of $340 is, uh, I would say, well, um, it would be acceptable. Lee, can you try to come to an end, please? Hmm. And so just some few key points here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is uh, appears to be something very easy to implement in our in our patients. Is there any any quick question? Please raise up your hand. It appears to be not, not the case. Why, Chris? Um, Try to you start already to show your screen where we'll where I ask one more question to to um, Dr. Lee. Um, so, um, do, do you think that we need another trial to compare directly aflibercept on this regimen before we can really say that this is long acting, or do we have any stronger data to suggest that this will make a big difference? I I feel that at this point we can always say that it's not inferior but we can't say that it's superior. But if they are both the same, um, and if this Q16 week really, I, we can say that it is um, definitely durable because if you think about it, 48, in 48 weeks, after the first four loading dose, that's already like 16 weeks, right? Then you have 32 weeks left, because 48 minus 16 weeks, that is 32 weeks, right? And 32 weeks, you only have, you can, you're, you're only able to say that you can, you can maintain the Q16 week two times with this mm -hmm. one year follow-up. Mm -hmm. But if you are able to do this just for one year, the price that you actually save about $1,500. If you like really try to be nitpicky about it, you, you, you potentially can save $1,500. I, I think I think we are all very motivated to try this out, and I would also reckon that from patients from the patient perspective, there, there there will be much interest in 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 this new option. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, because of we are running out of time a little bit, I would like to pass on to Dr. Bear, who will um, talk about an even more innovative approach about gene therapy in AMB. Let's take it away. Thanks, Dr. Schmitz Walkenberg. Can you all hear me and see my screen? Okay. Okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, for those who don't know me, my name is Chris Bear. I'm the first year retina fellow here at Moran, and, and we're gonna talk about a potential one-time treatment with new gene therapy. I'm really excited to be able to present this to you. I have no financial disclosures to talk about. Um, so just to quickly start, and we're gonna move through this pretty quickly in the interest of time, but as a representative patient, we have an 80-year-old woman with exudative macular degeneration. These are fundus photos showing macular drusen, retinal pigmentary changes. A little bit about her treatment history. Her right eye started receiving intravitreal injections in May of 2020. You can see her presenting OCT here with subretinal fluid. Um, she was stable at four weeks um, um, with resolved fluid until September of this past year, where she had recurrent subretinal fluid. We continued her at four week injections, and presently she's doing well with no uh, residual fluid. Her uh, vision is stable at 2025. Her left eye was started receiving injections in uh, December of 2019, initially received injections every four weeks, um, transitioned to every eight weeks. You can see her presenting OCT here with, again, a little bit of subretinal fluid and kind of this classic double hump sign. Um, she had recurrent fluid and subjective vision changes in September of 2021 with, you can see intraretinal cysts here on her OCT. And then despite receiving injections every four weeks, she has persistent interretinal and subretinal fluid. You can see here her vision decreased from about 2030 to 2060 at this OCT here. So we tightened her to every two weeks, alternating ILEA and Avacid injections. Uh, and you can see she's had resolution of her subretinal and interretinal fluid with stabilization of her vision down to about 2030, which is kind of close to her baseline. So in a patient like this, what would you do? You can continue injections at frequent bases every two or four weeks. Um, that becomes problematic um, every two weeks with insurance companies not wanting to uh, reimburse that or do that every two weeks. And then injections every four weeks, you know, can be a little bit burdensome for patients. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Photodynamic therapy is always an option, although it's not our first line treatment and there are risks and side effects associated with that. Or is there something else we can do? We've heard about a couple of things already today. Um, I think we already know about the burden of anti-VEGF treatments. I'm just going to kind of skip over this. Um, 
I want to get to the kind of highlights here, which is the new gene therapy trial that Miranda is going to be participating in. This is called the Atmosphere Study uh, for patients with neovascular AMD. And this is a, a partnership with Regenix Bio, offering a potential one-time treatment for patients with neovascular AMD. The purpose of this study um, is to take this AAV8 viral vector with a gene encoding for an anti-VEGF monoclonal antibody and with a subretinal approach, um, induce and transfect R retinal RPE cells to produce this anti-VEGF uh, molecule that's designed to sequester and neutralize uh, VEGF molecules produced um, in these pathologic states. Uh, this vector particularly has been studied and has been shown to have reduced immunogenicity, reduced pathogenicity, and has been shown to uh, have increased uh, levels in the retina, making it, I think, an ideal candidate for uh, subretinal gene therapy like we're seeing here. This is a high-level overview um, of the study. So walking you through what this slide shows, this study is going to be um, looking at, uh, taking place at about 60 sites, trying to enroll 300 subjects. There's going to be three arms. Patients are going to be randomized um, equally uh, to these three different arms. The first arm is a control group. You can see my mouse down here. Uh, these patients are going to be randomized to receive monthly ranibizumab injections. The other two groups are going to be uh, the study medications of so the treatment groups, and they're going to receive different doses uh, of the study medication. These doses have been determined uh, based on efficacy and safety data from the earlier phase one and phase two A data. Um, the patients, all patients will receive preoperative or uh, 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 ranibizumab injections at four week intervals. You can see here, the patients randomized to the treatment group will then undergo uh, surgery. And we'll talk about what that looks like here in a minute. All patients will receive a post-operative um, ranibizumab injection, and then patients who are in the control group will continue to receive monthly ranibizumab injections through the duration of the study. Um, patients who are in the treatment group will uh, receive injections on a PRN basis, and that PRN basis uh, is determined by the investigators uh, if they're receiving, if they see new CNVM activity, new fluid on OCT, if they have reduction in vision, or if they have new hemorrhage on exam. Um, these patients uh, all are going to uh, need to be pseudophagic, um, and all patients, uh, were ex these study excludes patients with severe subfoveal pathology, similar to the PDS studies, uh, severe subfoveal atrophy, uh, or fibrosis. So the way this is delivered is through a standard vitrectomy. So a patient has a standard three-port vitrectomy. Uh, and then using the MED-1 microdose injector, which you can see here, attached to the DORC 41-gauge subretinal extendable cannula, uh, it allows the surgeon in a very safe and controlled way to inject a subretinal, uh, to inject the medication and create a subretinal bleb in the inferior retina. Um, we're aiming for about a 200 microliter um, bleb. Uh, patients have received their standard post-operative care with standard post-operative drop regimens um, and um, uh, special positioning requirements. Here you can see upright positioning um, for patients uh, with discharge. So we're excited about this for a few different reasons. Um, number one, this, uh, this is data from the earlier phase one and phase two aid, uh, studies. And this gene therapy is shown to be number one, very safe and well tolerated. You can see that the common adverse effects here um, are similar to what's been presented already today. Um, we have conjunctival hemorrhage. Importantly, uh, postoperative inflammation was mild and resolved on its own. Uh, there are patients, the most common was retinal pigmentary changes. Again, most were mild. Um, the two that were severe um, uh, were observed uh, with, uh, uh, were more significant when patients had uh, uh, blebs made in the superior retina, which has been changed now to uh, have blebs done in the inferior retina in, in our uh, ongoing studies. Um, and again, no patients had uh, uh, permanent reductions of visual acuity. Um, and there were no evidence or no incidences of endophthalmitis or retinal detachments or issues like that. And we're excited because this seems to be effective. So this um, graph shows you um, reductions, uh, injection rates in patients pre and post um, intervention here. And what you can see, I've highlighted these cohorts here because these are the um, concentrations of the medication that we're going to be giving in in this uh, upcoming study. And you can see that there's a pretty significant and sustained reduction in injections, so a 60% reduction um, extending all the way up to two years in these patients. And about a third of these patients have not needed any anti-VEGF injections um, during the course of the, of the trial. So 
Um, these are all things that you know we're excited and we're um, going to be offering here at Moran um, uh, in, in the near future moving forward. If you're interested in more information, so the clinicaltrials.gov registry for the studies listed here. And then um, Regenix Bio had a nice press release about their phase one and phase two A data at this link right here. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll, I'll cut it short there. Um, a special thanks to a few folks here. So Dr. Bernstein for um, you know, getting us in on this study here. And then uh, Lillian Chen and Gina Karst, uh, Kart says who um, are our contacts at Regenix Bio and have been really helpful in presenting some of the slides you see here and, and forwarding a lot of the data and information that we've seen. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap it up there, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, but like I said, we're excited about this and, and looking forward to getting patients on this treatment moving forward. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Bear. This was, 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 this was wonderful. Um, so I think we, there, there are good reasons to be excited. Um, please raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Bernstein would like to add something. Um, before he is uh, getting online. And um, Chris, what could be in the long term? I think one concern might be in the long term that you constantly suppress um, VEGF and you, we are all aware about the discussions on atrophy development. Yeah. So uh, any thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, you know, that's a really good point. And I think that um, this is where the the, the long-term studies are going to be beneficial in seeing, you know, the developments of atrophy um, moving forward. So um, Regenix Bio is currently, you know, uh, having long-term follow-up. Um, so these patients in the initial phase one and phase two A studies are being followed out to five years. Um, and obviously we don't have that data yet, but um, I think those will be really helpful in, you know, determining the rates of atrophy and, and um, uh, you know, moving forward. But you're right, that is a concern and, and you know, something that we have to consider in patients moving forward. So um, I'm online now. I just wanted to add that we are uh, today actually is our site visit, a site initiation visit. So we are approved and ready to go on this. And I have at least one patient. In, fa in fact, it's the patient that uh, Chris presented who seems very interested. Um, her her husband is a is a is a retired surgeon, so they've already gone online and gone through the risks and benefits. I actually offered them the various options of you know of having the port versus uh, new drugs, and they seem very interested in going ahead with this. So, uh, and I think she'd be a very good candidate for this because we really have to do a lot of injections on her. Another uh, thing I don't think you mentioned on this th is that this study in the past, and I think still going forward, is really looking at biomarkers with this too, because we there are paracenteses done to show that this drug is being made essentially in the eye and is detectable in the anterior chamber. So it's it does, and they'll be able to see if it's really a sustainable effect. Chris, since you're the uh, fellow unmuted, I'll ask you this question. Uh, you know, if, if you uh, were betting on any one uh, of these, do you feel like that there's a, a pathway toward one becoming dominant in the market, or is there not really a holy grail and it's going to perhaps be a little bit more like MIGS that uh, just, just an abundance of options? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that this, it's really important to, you know, consider patient factors and patient selection and what you're treating, and what, 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 what treatment recommendations you're offering. Um, you know, I think that the easiest one is going to be, you know, Ferisimab. Um, it's an injection that we already do in clinic patients are already used to that. And so, you know, I think that's going to be the, the low hanging fruit you know, as to say, and the easiest thing to get patients on board with. Um, you know, these patients that have recalcitrant disease, like you know, the patient I showed here, um, you know, ferisimab might be a good option for that patient, but for maybe more long-term or more sustained um, treatment for those patients, gene therapy or the port delivery system might be better for those patients. So that's kind of a, I know, kind of an unsatisfying answer to your question, but I think it kind of comes down to um, you know, there's a lot of patient factors that come into play. The, the easiest one to do would be frisimab because it's something patients are already used to, but these other treatments and, you know, the other things that Dr. smith Valkenberg mentioned down the line, um, I think are going to play a role, um, a big role moving forward. I think it's a wonderful situation for us right now to actually investigate what is the best best option for patients. Yeah? So we will have longer discussions with patients, I'm, I'm, I'm sure about it, and uh, yeah, we will find out. 